Welcome to the next episode of the Category Mistake. I'm your host, Richard Mariello, and uh, these podcasts are becoming harder and harder to be weekly. They're closer to bi-weekly now. Um, my video is a little weird looking, but I, hopefully that will fix itself. Um, I'm coming today from the attic. I guess that's where I live sometimes when I do these things. It's the only place I can actually get quiet because um, our livelihood and our lives are a little crazy. Um, so yeah, I am doing today on something kind of crazy. Um, right now, the phenomenon phenomenon, phenomenon of the world is, of course, a Disney movie. The Disney movie is Encanto, which I'm probably saying wrong because I'm not in a heritage or a language type to do the rolling of the R's and the N's and the doing it the right way, but everyone knows the movie. Well, not everyone. If you are under the age of like 80 and you have kids or no kids or have teenagers or no teenagers, you probably know the movie. Um, if you're above 80, you have no kids and no grandkids and you don't watch television, then you have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's okay. This isn't for you anyway. So, Encanto. Encanto is a, um, a, a movie where a family has all different magical powers because the grandmother and grandfather have sacrificed and... They've been rewarded with a candle that gives them great power, which comes great responsibility. Thank you, Spider-Man, for that. And in the movie, you have one character who gets no powers, and it's a tragedy. It's, it's just, it doesn't go well, and oh my lord, I don't know what's going on. The whole movie is about which each person can do for their powers and how each person's powers well, each person's powers helps the community in a different way. Short, short, sweet, right? Um, but here's the thing. This one girl has no powers, right? And let's see if this is actually working. It is. Okay. I'm looking at my phone. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure I was actually going through because I have no one on right now. And so I don't know what's going on. So anyway, one girl doesn't get powers. And... This lovely man called Bruno, who was a brother, who was a son to the first woman. Um, he has premonitions and they always seem to go wrong. And he has a premonition about the girl with no power and then he disappears. Um, no one even knows what the premonition is. They don't understand it. They just know that we don't talk about Bruno. It's like a song basically saying that every time he... Made a premonition, bad things happened, nothing good ever happened, da 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 da. So that's how it worked. Well, of course, throughout the movie, you find out more and more that maybe Bruno wasn't the bad guy, um, even though in the song he looked to be the bad guy. Um, he's looked to be the bad guy. He's looked to be someone that, well, everyone needs to be worried about. Towards the end of the movie, of course, you realize that, well, He's having visions, but people aren't seeing the visions for what they are. Uh, Maribel, or I think that's her name, or how you say it, um, her vision was basically the house is crumbling and they saw a picture of her, so they assumed that she was the one who was going to make the house crumble and lose all their powers. Farthest from the truth, she actually helps hold the house together. She brings the family back together, yada, yada, yada. Everyone's happy. End of the movie, right? Lots of songs. Because it's the Disney movie with Lin-Manuel writing the music. So, of course, it's got to have lots of catchy tunes. Um, so what I'm talking about today is not, of course, just the movie. It's about one of the songs. Um, and the song is kind of dramatically perfect for me. Um, it's called. It's not called Don't Talk About Bruno. Okay, Just in case you thought that's where I was going. I'm not going there. Okay, um, It's called Surface Pressure. It's about the strong sister, or does it be cousin, sister, whatever, depending on who you're, which family member you're talking about, because there's lots of them. Um, her job is to carry things, pick up things like pianos and donkeys. Always the donkeys, I don't get that. Um, move bridges, just her job is to hold it, hold all the strong stuff together. Just hold it all together, that's what you do. Um, 
part of her lyrics are, you know, I don't ask how hard the work is. Got a rough, indestructible surface. Diamonds of platinum, I find them, I flatten them. I take what I'm handed, I break what's demanding. But under the surface, I feel berserk as a tightrope walker in a three-ring circus. Under the surface. So she's talking about how there's unimaginable pressure on her to be perfect, to show off, to do her thing, to be the show in a sideshow. She's the act in the circus. Um, kind of like she, you know, the circus used to have animals, of course, you know, that would perform, but you'd also have high wire acts, you'd have clowns, you'd have daredevils, you'd have all this stuff. And the spotlight was always on them. And they were always expected to be perfect. Even if they had an accident, it had to be like a crazy accident. It couldn't just be, oh, they slipped and hurt their ankle. It was like, you know, they ended up in a hospital in a body cast. You'll see them all the time on like America's Got Talent or all these shows where they talk about, well, I've broken my legs seven times or, you know, lost all my teeth or they have to perform because that's all they know how to do. So the girl in this movie, of course, she is also feeling that way. She's feeling like um, if she can't do what she's supposed to do, if she can't be the best she can be, if she can't carry the load for everybody, then she's worthless. Now, I know in my avenue, I feel the same way. But as a cartoon character in Disney, it seems really deep. It seems really, really deep that they would give a character such stress and anxiety. And it kind of works with the world we live in today. You have a lot of people who feel like if they can't perform, if they can't do their best, if they're not on 24-7, then they have no value. Um, You have athletes who don't retire because they don't want to feel like they're nothing. You have people who work 90 hours a week because they feel like they have to be recognized and they have to do their best. And if no one's noticing them, then that means that they're not of value and they don't mean anything. You have a girl that in this movie, spoiler, if you haven't seen it, I mean, I think everyone who would see it has seen it. Um, she starts losing her powers in the middle of the movie and she can't handle it. Not because she's weak, but because she's letting everyone down. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, I feel that way a lot, but she literally keeps going throughout, you know, the pressure, like a drip, drip, drip that will never stop. I mean, we all know we eh, the dripping, you know, usually it's like an air conditioner or a sink. It just drips. And you'll hear it at night. It'll just keep you up. You're just going, shut up. Stop the drip. The drip is annoying. Stop dripping. Drip, 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 drip. Okay? All the time. It just keeps going. It's annoying. It's crazy. Um, but she's comparing her stress to the drip that never stops. The pressure on her never stops. Then it goes... Um, Everyone always says, give it to your sister. Your sister's older. Give it to her. Give her all the heavy things we can't shoulder. Who am I if I can't run with a ball? If I fail. So everyone in her life has given her everything that's hard to do. It's hers. If they can't do it, she can do it. And if she can't, well, there's no option. She has to. That's her job. That's what she's here for. That's that's what gives her value. Um. Some people in the world today, you know, if they're if they can't get a hundred thousand likes, or if they can't um, get the largest paycheck, or if they can't do something, they feel like they're doing nothing, um, and that's really a weird way to live. And that's I'm saying this because that's my that's my conundrum. Um, that's my my uh, my challenge. 
My challenge, which I know must be some of your challenges, is how do you live your life and be o- being okay without being okay? How do you live your life with the world stress piling up, the expectations of people out there? I have a lot of expectations on me. I do. Um, some of them I bring upon myself. Some of them I don't. Some of them I have built into my life. Um, I have always been strong. I've always figured out a way around things. I've always figured out how to deal with stressors and anxiety and compartmentalize and just do what I need to do to get things done. And my kids have seen it. My wife has seen it. My other people, my wife have seen it. People see it and they're always like, well, how do you handle that? Oh, Richard can do it. Richard can do it. Richard can do it. I can't. And I was watching this movie yesterday with my grandson. And I've watched it. Yesterday was not the first day I've ever watched it. Um, I've watched it probably like 20 times probably by now. But I was watching it yesterday. And I'm watching this strong woman lifting donkeys and, you know, bridges and the world. She's literally holding up the world and part of it. And I wasn't just listening to the lyrics. I was looking at the body language of a cartoon, which just, you know, that takes some skill right there. Watching a cartoon and figuring out body language. Whoever designed this character, good job, Disney. Okay. This is why you're the best. Um, There was self-doubt in her eyes. There was fear in her eyes. There was stress, anxiety, depression in her eyes. Because she knew that if she lost her strength, people would look at her like she was nothing. That's what's in her head. They all think I'm strong, and if I'm not, well, what am I then? And that's that's a great question, right? You, you think to yourself, that's a great question. Because as a father, as a husband, as a pop-pop slash grandfather, whatever you want to call me, I call myself pop-pop, um, I judge myself the same way. If I can't be the one who stays up all night with a sick child, if I can't be the one that drives 12 hours to help a child in one of my kids, if I can't be the one that goes to the garage and talks to the mechanic and tries to work out a deal for the car to be fixed earlier, if I can't be the one who goes to a concert, not because I want to, but because I feel like that's what's expected of me, if I can't put glitter in my hair and hair dye and a bow and all these things, if I can't do that, what am I? When I go to church, I do a lot of the equipment that I do, the sound and computers and all that stuff. And when there's a problem, they come to me and they're like, well, fix it. And I'm always worried that I'm not going to be able to fix it. Because what am I if I can't fix it? You know, what am I doing there if I can't fix it? What am I if I can't do things that I think people are expecting from me? Now, when I first had kids, I had no idea what I was doing. Um... I didn't. I had no idea. I mean, my daughter was born and I was an idiot. My son was born, still an idiot. My other son was born. You guessed it, still an idiot. But what I did do is I set up myself for unreal expectations. Here's how. I grew up with parents who tried. 
looking at it now, they tried. I know they tried. They did their best, right? Um, I didn't like how they did it. So what I decided to do was I was going to be the opposite of what I thought my parents did. So my father was never around because he lived in a different state. Now, I had other people in my life. I did. Um, but they weren't my father. So I promised myself, I'll always be there for my kids. If they need me, I'll be there. Um, doesn't matter if it's 2 in the morning or 6 in the afternoon. It doesn't matter. I'm going to be there. And for the most part, I have. I have gone all over this country for my kids because that was what I expected of myself. So when my kids started getting older, I, I started li trying to live up to these expectations. The problem with that is that you can't live up to expectations that aren't possible. Um, I can't be in all my children's lives at the same time. I want to be. I really do. I really want to be in their lives all the time. I really do. I can't be. I have kids in North Carolina, Texas, soon to be New York. I have them here in Maine. I have them lots of different places. But I can't be a part of all their lives at once. It just doesn't work that way. Um, just like, you know, I like my siblings. I can't be in their lives. They live in, you know, one lives 20 minutes from me, but one lives in, you know, 24 hours for me if I drive without stopping. So the only time I talk to them is, you know, we catch up once in a while, but we don't talk that much. I don't talk to my kids as much as I want. And I always feel guilty about it. I feel guilty that I'm letting my kids down. Um, I'm letting somebody down by not being Superman. I'm not Superman. I'm really not. I wish I was sometimes, but I'm not. I'm not Superman. I'm living the life of the girl from surface pressure. I can't live with the expectations that I put on myself and others have put on me anymore. I can't. Um... So, in the song again, it says, but wait, if I could shake the crushing weight of expectations, would that free some room up for joy or relaxation or simple pressure? You know, I don't know. I mean, like yesterday, I had three hours by myself. Could I sleep? No. Could I relax? Not really. And when I when that three hours were up, I went right back to what I was doing before. I did not try to relax. I did not try to come to grips and have some me time. I decided, well, this person's here, this person here, so I need to perform. Um I don't put down monkeys or bears, but I kind of sometimes feel like a performing monkey or performing bear. I feel like that when I'm teaching. I feel like that when I'm with my kids. I feel like that I'm like that all the time. I don't know. I don't know how to just be. Be okay. Be calm. Be quiet. We went to Brazil last summer. And the whole time, I wasn't relaxed because I wanted my wife to have a good time. I wanted her to enjoy where we were, and I was afraid that if I didn't be, if I wasn't mentally ready or prepared or doing the right thing, she wouldn't have a good time and she would regret going. Now, logically, that sounds like a fallacy and kind of dumb. That's how I was thinking for two weeks. Then we went to North Carolina and Texas and California, and I felt even worse because we had other kids with us, so I had not just my wife, but these two kids. I had to make sure they had a good time, and then we saw my grandson and granddaughter, and I wanted to make sure that their time was special, and it just, I couldn't just sit in the moment. 
I made expectations that were high and I didn't know how to get out of it. And then, of course, I went back to school and I can't meet the expectations of that either, but I'm trying real hard, right? I'm trying. I'm just not doing as well as I want. So again, how do I, how do I, how do you, how does somebody come to grips with not being on? Maybe this is just a me problem. Maybe there's very few of you like me that think um, you have to be available 24-7. Or if something comes up, you have to be ready to go. I probably don't sleep heavy because our grandson now lives with us for right now. And I'm worried about him getting up. So I sleep light. I slept better when they weren't here. And that's not because I hate my grandson or hate my... No, it's because my brain automatically flipped a switch. I can't just sleep. Just like yesterday... I had a puppy in the room with me while we were sleeping and he couldn't get settled. And I was worried about him doing something stupid. He's not going to do anything stupid, but in my brain he could have. So I just couldn't sleep. But there was no one else at home, so I didn't want to put the puppy out because if the puppy was out, then he could actually do something stupid. So I'm like, I'll keep him in here so there's no chance of him being stupid. And then of course, anyway, horrible time. I don't know if I have to completely explode, shatter, break, crack um, to stop the way I'm feeling. Um, yesterday was pretty close. Um, yesterday, last night, I kind of lost it. You see, I'm going through some stuff and um, my wife has said, well, why don't you talk to the kids about it so they can understand what you're going through so they don't put so much on you. And I haven't. We're going to do that today. Uh, She's kind of gently pushed me into realizing I need to do that. She's going to do it with me is why. Um, And then she, you know, she's also reminded me that, you know, my way of being a parent isn't always the best for being a grandparent. Um, Also, my way of being a parent isn't the same for adult children compared to kids' kids, right? So our daughter is going through some stuff, and I thought it was dealing with it well. I thought it was dealing with it the right way. I thought my tone was good. But it wasn't. I don't know how to fix it. I'm I'm still struggling with that. But um, it wasn't. Um, I'm being told that my grandson has feelings, and I guess I understand he has feelings. I'm not saying I'm not a monster. I'm thinking kids don't have feelings, but I've never thought that I had to care about their feelings when it's something small and insignificant. But it's small and insignificant to me. It might not be small and insignificant to them, right? And that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is, great, I don't think it's a big deal. But it's not my big deal, it's theirs. Okay, and that's where I think I, I struggle with a little bit too, is I don't know, you know, I'm guessing... I'm guessing what they consider a big deal and what they don't. So again, I need to work on learning how to do that. I'm cracking, but I haven't cracked. And I'm wondering if I should crack. I wonder if I should just lose my mind for a couple days, completely reboot my whole system. You know, in technology, when things don't work, what do they tell you to do first? When you talk to John in India, they say, have you turned it off? Turn it back on. And sometimes I feel like I need to do that with my, my life. I need to turn it off, turn it back on, right? 
I need to just reboot. Unplug myself for 12 seconds, plug myself back in. Maybe that's what I need to do. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with the stress that's going on in my life. Now someone will say, well, go to therapy. I've been going to therapy. Some might say, well, maybe you need to breathe or do meditation or do some physical activity. I breathe. I don't do meditation. I do as much physical activity as I can. A lot of it, though, and some of you might understand this, a lot of it is I have pain, and that pain is exhausting. And because it's exhausting, I'm tired. And when I'm tired and I do things, I get more pain, which leads to more exhaustion and so on and so forth, right? Um, I had doctors tell me, well, you can't do this anymore, and so I stopped doing it. Well, the problem with stopping everything that you do that brings you joy is you have to find something to fill your life up with that joy, things that you enjoy. So I like ribs. Can't eat ribs right now. I like to have a Bud Light like three times a year. Can't do that right now. I like to drink Mountain Dew or caffeinated beverages. Can't do that right now. Those small things brought me joy. Now, it seems silly. Ribs, beer, Mountain Dew. How does that bring you joy? It brings me joy because it reminds me of a time when I could do things and no one was expecting me to be anything. See, for the first, throughout high school, till even I got married, till my daughter was born, I felt no pressure to be anything. Heck, most of the people I knew thought I was going to be nothing or dead or in prison. So to me, it was easy. There's no expectations. None at all. Then I have a daughter. Expectations. I have a son. More expectations. I have another son. More expectations. Then we started helping out, helping out other kids. More expectations. Join the army. Lots of expectations. Deploy. A ton of expectations. I come home, more expectations. Since about 27 years ago, 27 years ago, I have not felt like I don't have the weight of my, the world on my shoulders. That's not my wife's fault, not my kid's fault, not my grandkid's fault. It's... I set myself up for it. And because of the way I was raised, I can't just stop. I can't just um, move on. I can't just let go. I can't just brush it aside. At church, I've had a girl who's, well, woman, um, who has been doing what I did on one of the sides of the stuff, computers, for the last like six months. She's really good. It's taken me six months to acknowledge that she's really good and I don't have to be there for it. It's taken me that long to realize that I can be replaced and be okay with it. I still have other things I have to do, but that makes it so I have one less thing to do. There are other people in my life who can help out with technology in my house. There are other people in my life who can help out with going places and doing things. My wife knows how to drive, yet when we're together, I drive. I always feel like we have to be there early, not late. I feel like I have to go fast enough to where we get there early, not late, but not so fast that she feels like we're, you know, going 4,000 miles an hour. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of back and forth. Um, 
my daughter and our my other daughter were in Cranberry, Pennsylvania and got into a car accident. There were people who were closer that could have helped. Nope. I loaded up my car and drove 12 hours and I went and saved her because that's what I thought I had to do. I thought if I didn't do that, I was a horrible father and I didn't deserve a daughter. And that's just stupid. If you think about it, that's just stupid. There's no reason for me to do that other than I felt like I needed to. I've also had, you know, a daughter who moved up here with her husband and they had a U-Haul and I rented a car, drove down there and drove up a U-Haul. Could they have driven the U-Haul by themselves? Probably. Could they have gotten me up here safely? Most likely. Did I need to drive eight hours down, eight hours back without a break? No. Did I? Yes. Again, makes it challenging, right? I give out advice, but I don't take it. So my big question, um, big idea, big question, big whatever, is a simple one, I think. But it's big for me, but maybe simple for others is, how do you do it? How do you just be okay with being okay? How do you be okay with being not Superman? See, I always watch the Superman movies and The Flash and um, Green Arrow and all these other shows and movies. Captain America, all these people. Not really Captain America, Iron Man, but mostly DC people, Batman. And it's not Batman being Batman or Superman being Superman. It's when it's Clark Kent or Bruce Wayne or Barry Allen or Oliver Queen. How are they okay with being those people when they know they're expected to be the superheroes? How is Hawkeye in the TV show, if you haven't watched it, but if you have watched it, you understand this more. Hawkeye hates being thanked for being Hawkeye. He's in New York. People are trying to buy him dinner. He's like, no, 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 I'm good. I'll pay the bill. Like, well, no, you saved us. He's like, dude, I showed up. It's my job. He struggled with it also because... Well, let's be honest. He didn't like being the hero, but he knew he had to be. He could have left New York, went to Texas with his family. But instead he stayed because he felt like he had to. And he saved the city and da da da, da everyone's happy. Um, but Oliver Queen, Clark Kent, Barry Allen... How are they okay when they are those characters watching the world thinking, I could maybe save them, but knowing you can't save everybody? You can't. There's no way of doing it, right? You can't be Superman to everybody. In the first Superman movie, I think, or first or second, I think it was the second one, actually, Lois Lane dies. Spoilers, from like 1979, so you've been seeing it by now, that's your fault. Lois Lane dies in an earthquake from something Lex Luthor did, because it's Lex Luthor. So Superman loses his mind. He spins the world backward, goes back in time, which we all know doesn't work, but you know, it's a movie, it's fine. Spins the world backwards, she gets out of there, boom, done, no problem. He doesn't think about all the positive things that happened that he's ending. He just does what he wants, right? Because that's what his job is. How is he okay with that? How is the Hulk, when he snaps his finger in Endgame, think of all the people who were in the midair that disappeared. All dead. No consequences there, right? Just thousands and thousands of people falling out of the sky, squish. 
people in helicopters or in cars that crashed and died because the driver went away. Splat. No one thinks about that. But in Encanto, I don't even know what the character's name is. I always forget her name. I can Google it. That's why we have Google, right? Um, she thinks about it. She thinks about it all the time. She thinks about why or who or what happens if I do this, do this, do this. It is a service person song by Louisa. There we go. Louisa doesn't just say, I'm the strongest, I'm the greatest, da 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 da, right? She's thinking about the community and what happens to them if she fails. The Hulk, Superman, Iron Man, Thanos, actually Thanos, I'll give him credit. He thought about it, what he was doing. But all the others, when they snapped, when they did Superman, when he brought the world backwards, Hulk's like, I try to get her back. He wanted Black Widow back. No one cared about Gamora, but Black Widow, right? He didn't think about the consequences for his actions. He just did it. Same with Iron Man. She's thinking about her consequences. See, my thing is when I'm under this pressure, I look at everything and I, I overanalyze it. I say, okay, if I do this, these one of 12 things can happen. Oh my God, can I deal with the consequences if any of these happen? What am I going to do? Ah, it's more like, ah, okay. I don't know. So the question is, how do they do it? How do you do it? If you deal with stress and anxiety and you're great at it, if you deal with the pressure of the world on your shoulders all the time, how do you do it? My brain, the category mistake that it is, has never been able to, in the last 27 years, has not been able to just live in the moment. When I was deployed and I was doing stuff on generators and air conditioners, I wasn't thinking, I got to fix this right now. It's, I got to fix this so this can work, so this can work, so this can work, so this can work, so this person can da 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 I never just thought about it as a quick little fix. It was 25 steps to an oil change. It's 25 steps to clearing off fan filters. It's 25 steps for everything. When I was driving the trucks, I would look on where we were going and I would plan the whole trip. During the trip, I'm still replanning it, going, you know, that's a really tight turn. Can I make that turn? If I can't make that turn, how many turns do I need? I should be able to make that turn because I'm supposed to be able to drive this thing. And if I'm not a good driver, then what the heck am I doing here? I'm going to get everyone killed. So then I'd put the pressure on myself to make sure I made that turn in one try. I would read manuals. I would stay up late. Because I was always worried that someone's life could be ended or destroyed because I didn't read a page. Which is crazy. It's just crazy, you know? I watch Jeopardy and I'm nervous about getting an answer wrong. It's Jeopardy. Who cares? So any of you guys have that, your logical mind and then your crazy mind, your stress mind, the mind of yours that just has a hard time contemplating reality. If you're watching on Twitch or on the podcast itself, listening, I have a Twitter page with this, um, same name, the category mistake, um, I have everything you can think of. 
Give me some suggestions. Give me some ideas. If you know who I am and you have my phone number, text me some I don't care. Just if you know how to deal with this, other than losing my mind and going to a place where I can hug myself for a couple of days, I would greatly appreciate it. Because I'm tired. And I don't know how much longer I can do this at this speed in this level and I don't want to lose the level of the marriage I have or the level that I have with my kids so I need to figure this out so I can have a better marriage and a better relationship while not losing my mind thank you all for listening watching, sharing it's Richard Mariella. This is episode, I believe, 21 of the Category Mistake on our podcast. Um, I hope you all have a beautiful day. Until next week.